possess our very own definitive history of the world, a reference book that tells us instantly everything we want to know about our planet and more. Now, when this very large volume came out last year, thousands of people rushed out to buy a copy. But what they didn't realize that if they'd hung on a little bit, they could have become the proud owners of the ultimate in the compact and concise histories of the world, this wonderful little book, written by the world-renowned classical actor, thinker, and psychotherapist Desmond Olivier Dingle, probably most famous as artistic director of the National Theatre of Brent. And he's here today with the highlights of world history, starting, I suppose you could say, fairly far back. The birth of the dinosaurs. Many dinosaurs had brains the size of Brussels sprouts, and those were the bright ones. Less fortunate dinosaurs had brains the size of baked beans and took at least six weeks of relentless brain racking even to turn round. For the dinosaur, for instance, eating became a massively complex process, and a simple two or three course dinner could take months from start to finish. The main problem with eating for the dinosaur was that his brain, being so pathetically minuscule, had no room in it for what we in the medical profession call memory retention. In other words, not only did the dinosaur have extreme difficulty in remembering what was food and what wasn't, but also, and more crucial, he was always forgetting what feeling hungry felt like. So that many dinosaurs never actually knew they were hungry and often dropped dead without ever having had a proper meal. <laughs> Dinosaurs that did eat tended to be either carnivorous or herbaceous dinosaurs. Uh, um, carnivorous dinosaurs, being meat eaters, tended to eat the herbaceous dinosaur, seeing as the herbaceous dinosaur couldn't turn around and anyway didn't want to bite the carnivore because he was a vegetarian. I think I better move on now um, to the dawn of man. And for this, I would ask you to imagine the Earth's history as being the entire length of the M1, the M1 motorway up to and including the Leeds underpass at Junction 47. Now, if we were to do this, we would be truly amazed, as indeed I was, to discover that the history of humanity would have started no sooner than the roundabout at Hunslet, which is, of course, a mere one and a half miles from the city centre of Leeds itself, which is where, following the allusion through, we, the human race, stand today, at the centre of Leeds. <laughs> this is not, in fact, entirely accurate, seeing as the motorway does actually stop before the city centre and becomes the A58, which bypasses Leeds and heads off towards Weatherby, where it becomes the A1 to Catterick and Scotch Corner. But nevertheless, modern man would be standing in the centre of Leeds if the motorway did end there. A town planner's nightmare, Ken, which is why it doesn't. <laughs> in other words, the ancestors of you and I do not even begin this momentous journey until Junction 44, or even Junction 45. So, ladies and gentlemen, thus dawned the age of man. <laughs> well, I'm keeping an eye on the clock here now, Desmond, and you yeah. see you've only got about, oh, I don't know, about four minutes to go. So I'm going to have to skip yeah. um, civilization. I'm going to have to skip the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the Egyptians. I think we should move on to the Romans. The Romans. Yes. Yeah. Well, the Romans, I, whom I have personally studied in great detail, were the next civilization after the Greeks and were generally similar, wearing similar types of helmets and buildings, and generally doing similar kinds of things. Unlike the Greeks, however, the Romans were Italian. The Romans <laughs> were more sensible and generally older than the Greeks, most of whom, if their vases are anything to go by, wore extremely short tunics and next to no underwear that reveals more than they <laughs> hid, if you get my meaning, which is one of the major reasons why the Greeks became decadent and died out, which is why the Romans came in, of course, and a great relief to all concerned, if I may say so. Obviously, the Mediterranean countries are hot, I grant you, but that's no excuse for just walking about in the nude whenever you feel like it. <laughs> Greek nudity began, as it happens, in sporting activities, which you had to do in the nude for religious reasons. This was mainly seeing as the Greek gods, Zeus, Jove, Mars, Bounty, etc., was all <laughs> completely nude. <laughs> mm. Well, listen, I can't argue with the bare facts there, Desmond, I have to admit, but uh -huh. I've got to go through now, let's see, the rise of Babylon, yeah. got to go through the Dark Age, we'll skip all of that. Yeah. Let's go to the Renaissance. Don't you think a very interesting period? It, it, one of my favourite periods, the Renaissance, is in fact it was responsible um, for numerous things, particularly breakthroughs in art. And one of the most famous breakthroughs, in some cases literally, uh, was the art of perspective, <laughs> in which artists done paintings of distance that were so realistic that people thought you could walk into them. 
In fact, many Renaissance paintings were ruined because members of the public kept walking straight through them and out the other side thinking it was a, a real landscape garden or canal or whatever. Uh, this is why, a matter of interest, why many art galleries introduced the brass knobbed posts and white rope barriers that are still in use to this day. They've also been introduced into many banks and building societies and post offices, it happens. Although, of course, this is nothing to do with the art of perspective, obviously, but the, uh, the parlour state of queuing in present state uh, Britain. Well, your perspective is excellent. Thank do you, you think that we could skip everything else and yeah. just go to, the, what's it, the 19th century? Can we do that century. quickly? Yes. Yeah, we could very, very quickly. About I mean, 30 seconds of there, 30 seconds of the 19th right. century. Well, the 19th century, of course, uh, one of my uh, favourite periods, again, was famous, um, very, very important uh, for the emaciation of women. Uh, many of whom were outraged at the fact that only men got the vote and they weren't allowed to, which is absurd, obviously, seeing as that women are human beings the same as everyone else, obviously. Uh, the leader of the women in their struggle for emaciation was the famous majorette, Mrs Pankhurst, who chained herself to Buckingham Palace and committed numerous other atrocities on herself to bring the plight of um, women to the attention of the Queen, who was a woman after all, but who had unfortunately gone berserk owing to Albert having died, and she ordered Mrs Pankhurst lashed two sets of frenzied stallions galloping in opposite directions. Undeterred, women led marches, held conferences, wore trousers, had women only dances and became bus conductors and sat in circles with the moon painted on their brows, all of which had a profound effect on men who started breaking down the street, going into psychoanalysis and weeping for no apparent reason. Well, now, listen, listen, the clock, mm. almost, just seconds. Yeah. I've, I've got to know about the end of civilization as we know it. I want to know how the world ends. Well, how, 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 how the world ends? Well, according to a number of, um, of ancient forbidden parchments, which I have been uh, privy to, um, uh, they, which contain prophets of the future uh, by mankind. Uh, mankind, um, done by a select band of ancient llamas from Tibet, the whole world will end like nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, I always wanted to know. I mean, that's a pretty profound end. Thank so, you. Desmond, that was quite wonderful. I'm glad to know that we had the whole history in a matter of minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. <laughs> You may remember that yesterday we were looking at this painting, Van Gogh's Dr. Gachet. Well, it was sold in New York, and we estimated $50 million. In fact, a Japanese gallery paid an all-time record of $82 million, or 50 million pounds. So that's it for today. I hope you're going to join us tomorrow on the program. We'll be here at 9.20. Yuri Geller will be here, by the way. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>